Hello and welcome to the March 2021 podcast from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name's George Miller, and my guest this month is Renaud Lombert. Renaud is the deputy editor of the paper and the author of an in-depth article in this month's edition about democracy in South America. It's entitled Latin America's Feudal Castle. You'll hear why shortly. This year, there are elections in several Latin American countries. Peru and Chile will vote for president, and Mexico and Argentina will hold parliamentary elections. Looking at Latin America's experience with democracy since new nations gained independence from Europe, Renaud Lombard in his essay compares the continent's democrats to Icarus. The higher they climb, the closer they come to true democracy, the more vulnerable they are to a fall. And in Latin America, that usually means a military coup and dictatorship. Is there a cyclical pattern? Does it have deep structural roots? France's former ambassador to Brazil, Alain Rouquier, clearly thought the cycle had been broken when he wrote in 2010, After decades of instability and dictatorship, democracy seems to have taken root everywhere. We know now that was over-optimistic. The so-called pink wave of progressive governments that inspired his optimism did not last. The roots that Latin American democracy had put down turned out to be shallow. In our conversation, we explored the reasons for this. But when I spoke to Renaud recently, I started by asking him about the conditions which had enabled the pink wave to build in the first place. It was... um a very extraordinary period of improvement in people's living conditions, in work conditions, in the capacity for the region to coalesce and uh, oppose a united front to, you know, the um, very cumbersome neighbor, the United States. That happened in between uh, the late 1990s and in some countries is still going on, but more or less 2010s. And I said it was a very particular set of conditions. The first was that the previous decade had been characterized by a very, very hard uh, neoliberal offensive that made people react. I mean, poverty levels increased dramatically. Inequality increased uh, in the same, uh, in, uh, with the same speed. So that was the first trend. People needed a change. You know, society didn't work for them. The second was perhaps that the failure of the idea that the left could intend to change the world without taking power, an idea that had, you know, taken root in Chiapas, that had been theorized by um, John Holloway, that idea failed to take over the left. There were parts of the left that were still thinking that, well, if we did have the state behind us, perhaps we could do more. The third circumstance, and perhaps one of the most important, was the fact that China underwent a period of very, very fast growth that, was, uh, um, that increased its uh, requirements for raw materials that came from Latin America. So in turn, that meant for Latin America that a lot of cash flowed in. And the last condition for this to turn into something that was beneficial for the, for the population was that there was a set of characters, political characters, very specific to the various countries we're talking about that were available to make something of this very specific planetary alignment that made it possible politically, geopolitically, and in terms of the economy as well. So um, this is what happened um, in, during this um, so-called uh, uh, pink wave. So the wave rose, but the wave also broke. And, you know, we start from a very different vantage point from, from Rukier in, in 2010. And in your article in Le Monde Diplomatique, you use the, the image of Icarus, you know, who flies too near the sun. The higher he, he goes, the more vulnerable he becomes, which kind of suggests there's something intrinsically risky or vulnerable about the particular conditions for democracy in, in Latin America. Can you explain a little bit why you chose that, that image to try to convey 
that situation? Yeah, the idea is that there is a limit, a structural social limit as to how far democracy or what we have accepted to call democracy today will allow people to go, especially people from the left. Icarus would have been fine if he had not attempted to go as far as reaching the sun. But by going too far, his wings made of wax start to melt. And by going too far, he precipitates his own um, fall. There is a logic at the very core of democracy. It's a progressive, continuous increase in people's right, people's freedom, people's capacity to decide for themselves. And against this principle, this driving force, you might say, there is another that is as strongly inscribed in our society as, as the previous one, which is the logic of capitalist uh, profit making. And there is a point where the two logics collide and the wings of the Democrats start to, to melt. And this is what has happened over the course of centuries since mainly in the, in, in the independent, independence in Latin America, any time leaders attempted to push the boundaries of what was accepted by the elite a little too far, then there was a coup. Uh, there was a military intervention. There was a reaction. Um. You would argue, I think, that really to understand the situation in Latin America today, we have to understand something of the circumstances in which those nations gained their independence and what gaining their independence meant in terms of who actually had power and determined the way in which democracy was expressed. Yes, the, um, the democratic project of the 19th century never really came to fruition anywhere. I mean, that would be um, an argument you could uh, make for France, for instance. But there is something, something specific with Latin America, which is the fact that the people who initiated the, the revolutions, the, uh, the breakaway from the colonial powers, did intend for the colonies, the, the newborn countries, to enjoy more freedom, but they did not want the economic system, the social hierarchies, to change. Who were they? They were descendants from the colony, from Spain, from Portugal. And they benefited from the way Latin America had taken its place within the uh, international, the, the world economy system, which was a system whereby Riches came from trade, but there was no industry, no local industry. There was no room for the development of an internal market. So that means that independence used the vocabulary of social emancipation, of, of, of freedom, of a citizens' right, but only to break away from the center of power, from the colonial center of power, but not to actually democratize the, the societies, which means that there was a hiatus and which still remains in the way the societies were built and the prospects that they, they kind of drew in order to, to convince people to mobilize and the, the, the very real intention for society not to change. So this leads to what um, Fuentes, Carlos Fuentes, a Mexican writer, calls a feudal castle with a cardboard capitalist facade, which means that the, the root of, the, the, of feudalism remains in Latin America, despite the capitalist revolution. And Fuentes was talking in 1963 when he made that um, comparison. I mean, he's dead now, but if he were alive today, do you think he would recognise his description as still applying to the continent? Well, Fuentes changed um, his um, his tack over the, the the course of the years. You know, he was um, a supporter of Fidel Castro, of revolution, of the the people's right to autonomy. But in his latter years, he changed completely. He was not the first person to change over the years, but the the yeah. the, the, the latter Fuentes was, on the contrary, a good friend of the elite, the very people that the young Fuentes wanted to get rid of power. But let's imagine the young Fuentes was around today. If the young Fuentes was around today, he would probably, he would probably come to the conclusion that, yes, 
the very structure, the deep rooted structure that uh, were at the core of the problems he identified when he wrote that were still around. You mentioned Fuentes' trajectory, sort of political trajectory there. And an interesting idea that you mentioned in your article is this theory of the two demons. And I thought that was interesting because it, it, it sort of looks at what is posited as a twin danger, which is fascism and, and socialism and how they are in, interrelated. So I wondered if you could say how that theory sort of plays out in, in Latin America. Yes, I guess this theory is um, a very clear illustration of the fact that it's always the winners write history, don't they? So what happened after the, the, the period of the dictatorship, the history of, the, of how they came to happen had to be written. And one of the theories that came to um, the forefront, especially from the left, is the theory that, you know, two demons collided. The demon of socialist expectations, you know, wanted to shake society in something that it wasn't. And that demon woke another demon, which was the demon of military violence and military intervention. And the two demons were posited as being as bad one as the other. But one had the responsibility of having woken up the first one. So, you know, everybody was as <laughs> uh, guilty, but one was more guilty than the other. What it says is that dreaming of a more equal society should make you feel guilty because it means that if you do, if you do dream that dream, you will awake your enemy and you will be partly or you will be responsible for what your enemy will be doing. Now, for those people who are listening and who don't know, in those circumstances, what the enemy did, the second demon, is kill people, is imprison people, is throw people from planes into the ocean. So on the one hand, you have, you know, you have a set of people who are guilty for dreaming of equality, and the other, on the other hand, you have people who are presented as, as guilty as the first one, not more, and they are murderers. So that says something about, you know, the way history was written. And in Chile, for instance, where the dictatorship overthrew Allende in 1973, only three years after Allende came to power, over there, the name of Allende we embodied and the idea that you could um, work towards socialism through electoral processes. His figure has been abandoned by the left and was abandoned by the left until the students started to demonstrate uh, around 2010, which you know, says a lot uh, that the capacity of conservatives to deprive the left from projects, dreams, and uh, utopias, hopes you know, that we, uh, we had before. Yes, because you, you're sort of presenting a dangerous cycle, aren't you? A sort of model of a cycle where if progress goes too far, there will be a, a counter-reaction from the right and therefore, you the implication is that progress must be heavily circumscribed, limited, cautious, not do anything to upset the right and the military. And I said, it's a, it, it seems to me a dangerous mindset to get into. It's very common. As early as last night um, in France, I mean, on on a di very different topic, but similar. There was a full page, a full page article of this French um, intellectual. She, she's a, a university researcher and she has just published a book about, you know, the nightmare that were a pro Chinese con um, uh, convictions or, or dreams in the 1960s. And you have a lot of people like that. You know, they are they're, they're socialists. They are militants in their young age. And then they, they betray those dreams. Society provides them with a very comfortable place from which they can look back onto their former convictions and explain, no, but I was young. You should not do that. I did it for you. You know, trust in me. Don't go that way. And by so doing, they protect the interest of a society that is making them very comfortable. So there are plenty of those in Latin America. There are quite a lot in France as well. I'm sure the UK has its own. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, so you, you end up with the, the curious phenomenon of people in the left, I think it was Chile, wasn't it, where advisors on the left saying, well, you know, the colonel's economic policy 
did some good things. You know, where there's some things about their their sort of neoliberal economics that actually make sense. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's um there was a, a capacity for turncoats to present themselves as you know reasonable people, people who were capable of you know cherry picking you know good policies from the left and from the right. When in fact they, they were just people who had changed, um, you know, they they had flip flopped and they were no longer the people who they who they had been, you know, that has um, prevented Latin American left discourse from the capacity really to to dream, uh, because you know dreaming was always likely to reawaken something that people did not want to see again. I mean, you hear countless stories of mothers telling their young student children, you know, do not march in the streets. You know, we we did that and we saw what happened, you know, and that is something that should not be under, underestimated. Now, as I said in my introduction, this is a year of elections in several Latin American countries. And from your article the question of what is possible via the ballot box still seems to be a live one. Can, can you say something about that, um, particularly in this year of, of elections? Yes, it is, it is a very sore question. It is in Latin America. I think anyone who has followed Jer- Jeremy Corbyn in the UK or is thinking of how could things change in my country, you know, we'll be faced with that very frightening prospect, you know, how far can we go before we hit the reaction of the media? Corbyn has found out a lot about that uh, from, you know, the private sector, from other countries. Perhaps one country illustrates this more than others, which is Brazil. Uh, Lula, who was president in Brazil, uh, he was elected in 2002, and uh, it remained president until 2010. Lula is no common figure. Lula was a worker, a manual worker. He, has, um, he worked as a trade unionist for years. He contributed to creating the Workers' Party in Brazil in overthrowing uh, the dictatorship. He's uh, a man whose who's, um, honesty in, in wanting to change Brazil, no one can really doubt. When he came to power, Lula had attempted a couple of times and he knew what Brazil was like. He knew that if he wanted to transform Brazil into a more democratic democratic country, he had to make a couple of changes, change the constitution. Brazil is, is a very specific country. There was no a struggle for independence. You know, the, the former colonial power decided that Brazil was going to be a uh, kingdom. The constitution uh, reflected a very deep-rooted set of elite powers in the country. So the constitution needed to be changed. The media needed to be changed. They are all in the hands of, of, of private private owners, and they are political actors, adamant that you know nothing must change in this country. And he needed to change the economic model because Brazil is locked in a position whereby it provides raw material to other countries, but is um, unable to create an industry whereby it can produce its own goods and uh, provide work and for, for its, its own population. So this needed to be changed. And Lula knew all of this. He had written, he had talked about it. But when he came to Paris, he decided that the conditions were not, they, they were not there for him to do that. And maybe he was right. You know, it's very difficult to say. So instead of changing the system, Lula decided that he was going to use the system in order to benefit those people that he had been elected for, the poor. And he did. He he raised um, uh, um, uh, millions of people from poverty, you know, he lifted them from poverty. He made it more possible to um, start struggles in factories against landowners. It was a strategy that has been called a strategy of conciliation, whereby, you know, you give Jack a bit more, but you don't take from Paul. And uh, uh, from a geopolitical perspective, uh, Lula made it possible for, you know, great things to happen in the region, you know, things that probably Washington would have, you know, forbidden if Brazil had not said, no, there will not be a military intervention in, in this region when we are there. But the conditions that made it all possible, they collapsed. 
when the sea flows, everything is, you know, quite easy. But when it ebbs, it becomes more tricky, you know. And when it ebbs, the power of the elite, which had not been changed, which had not been tackled, manifests itself. And they are allowed to operate, and they did. And they threw Dilma, um, who was um, from the Worker Party, Workers' Party as well, they, they threw her out, they, they, they overthrew her for, with a, a, a parliamentary maneuver that is, you know, is as much of a coup as, you know, when soldiers um, move into a, a, a palace. So that leaves the question as to, you know, what can Lula do if he's um, elected in 2022? Because, you know, chances are he will be a candidate. That is an open question. At this stage, I don't think conditions are better for him to do in 22 what he was not able to do 20 years ago. But that doesn't mean, you know, things will not change in Brazil. Changing Bolsonaro for Lula is a massive change for most of the people who live in Brazil. It's a massive change for most of the people who live in the region. And it will be a massive change in the world. You know, having a world leader like Lula meant a lot, you know, from a geopolitical perspective. You know, the cards have been changed, dealt in a very different way. So that will change. And one thing with politics is that little changes down the line make it possible to start struggles that, were not yet, that you could not think about when the process started. So definitely some of us will be crossing our fingers when Lula is a candidate and the Brazilian population go to, the, go to vote. That was Renaud Lombard, who's written about democracy in Latin America in the March 2021 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. Borrowing from Carlos Fuentes, the piece is entitled Latin America's Feudal Castle. It's available at mondediplo.com. If you're a subscriber, you can read every edition of the paper going back over 20 years, as well as exploring other resources, such as maps, images, the podcast archive, and online exclusive content. And if you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of content online to entice you to become one. In the words of John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world, behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.